Welcome in to another episode of Your Drone Questions Answered, brought by Drone Launch Academy. I'm your host, Chris Breedlove. My guest today is Matt Nanny from ACOM. Matt, thanks so much for joining the show. So Matt, the question for this week is complex operations. What are some real world scenarios that are kind of outside of the box, how you've tackled them? But before we kind of get into some of those scenarios and stories, Matt, tell our listeners a little about your background and, and your experience in the aerial mapping space. Oh, sure. Um, so let's see, my name is Matt Nanny. I uh, work at ACOM. I've been there for about 16 years. I am the digital technologies and remote sensing manager. So I have a group that encompasses everything from UAS operations, satellite base, BIM, enterprise GIS, a whole gambit of folks there. And the nice thing is we can come up with some really interesting complex deliverables based on that. So my background, cultural resources, my background, that's my undergrad degree uh, with Appalachian State, wearing the t-shirt today. I just realized from there, I worked as a land surveyor for about three and a half years between that while I was in grad school. It was something I could balance the two of and got a master's degree in earth sciences for that. I've been started working at ACOM during that time in grad school and been here since. The biggest thing, and I, I think about this a lot career-wise as it applies to drones, the, the survey background, understanding that geospatial side and then getting into more of the GIS side of it as like my career advanced and that being more of a mainstay, that was... I think about that all the time, and it is one of the things that it was a key differentiator in me having some success within this industry. That's awesome. I mean, complex ops can go in so many directions, obviously. Maybe kind of set the stage as we launch into this discussion, Matt, and not to name particular client names, of course, but like, what are sort of sure. the types of client types and or project types that you guys take on? Yeah, sure. Um, so I work in uh, the environmental, we'll call it division business line within AECOM. Uh, we work with all business lines. My group in particular, we work with everyone. So a lot of transpose stuff, water things as well for that. But a lot of the use cases that we get or a lot of the questions asked tend to be just all over the place. It's exciting. It's also a little frustrating at times because it doesn't really allow you to, we have multiple niches. I'll, I'll phrase it as such. And so it might be something for like, you know, dams inspections for that. And that might be one week of activities. We do a lot with federal work and that can bring up a lot of interesting like use case opportunities, challenges. We've done you know, rare species habitat mapping, analysis uh, for that, say for like bald eagle nests, something along those lines. We've done disaster recovery work. One particularly interesting project was working on a railroad connection there in Eastern North Carolina and I'll leave everything vague on purpose. So post uh, Hurricane Florence, uh, and actually that's a great place to start the stories there. So we were brought in because they knew that there was a lot of damage that occurred during Florence. And we proposed a methodology by which we would go in, essentially walk the 31 mile corridor as best possible with the drone, fly as well, as long as we could see safely, visually, legally, then come back, walk that remainder and kind of bump through like that for those areas for that. Interesting challenges we ran into. So we had to coordinate with about six or seven different entities within the state and the federal side for that. Just like the North Carolina Forestry Park Service, there were federal entities, there was a railroad component too, to get uh, permission to be on the rail line for that. Luckily it was closed down, so that was a little easier than anticipated. Some of the interesting challenges we ran into were areas of just whole growth forest, where as we were told when we went to go seek permission with the state entities, they go, Oh, well, you better bring a hard hat. Well, like, why is that? It's like, oh, there's widow makers everywhere. You're like, say what? Um, they're like, oh yeah, trees fall and branches fall all the time. It's like, well, is, is the hard hat going to protect me? They're like, oh no, you should still wear the hard hat. I'm like, okay. <laughs> we avoided a couple areas based on that information, but just getting into, you know, down trees, washed out areas, road crossing areas, one area. And this is my, my favorite part of the story. We were flying, there's an area and you know, fly all day, you get a little tired. The whole operations took place over about four days. So by about day three, we got into a nice groove with everything, covering a lot of area, fly as far as we can see, taking a picture in Nader, looking straight down. That way we could geotag the area as well. I got pulled into an enterprise geospatial web application. And that way they would classify that information. So down tree, washed out area, a few different classifications and provided that to the end client for that, which they were very pleased with. Getting some of the shots there, we found one area and like, I think I see something. All right, let me just take an image just in case. I can always throw it out later and found a area where there's a huge culvert washout, like boom, flaming, like, you know, just the thing we were looking for, right? For the mm -hmm. entire project. So delivered that to the client, gave them a lot of very powerful information to look at found areas that were going over large waterways too, that were, you could not see from any side, found you know, massive amounts of damage that no one had seen before using the drone. So 
good in that case. And yeah, like coming down to like more advanced operations too, like just the amount of communication, prior thought that goes into it. That's a lot of what we discuss. Some of it learned through experience. We've run into that with say some of our federal clients, getting into some of the more complex communications, talking with different ATC entities, different, you know, in this case, in federal clients, we might be conversing with range control and other folks like that, having a different level of communications prior approvals for doing that, even down to what you can fly. Yes, a blue UAS, but what type of blue UAS? What are the capabilities for that? What are the payloads that it can interact with that? Or on the approved list, not on the approved list, and then getting seeking other approvals to be able to fly something for that. That can be a, a lot of challenges there. I would say from a planning standpoint, deconflicting with certain areas where there's ongoing other drone operations, something that not everyone's used to. So there might be an area where there might be like a special forces team, or they might be doing a live fire event. Sometimes you can fly over depending on the situation, if it's necessary. Sometimes you have to deconflict with those folks and just either talk with them in person or do that through other means through um, the scheduling mechanism for all of those ranges. We've run into a couple things there. One particularly interesting project we did was it was a post a well or a forest fire, which are you know controlled, sometimes controlled, sometimes not, or caused unintentionally, intentionally. I'll, I'll phrase it as such uh, for that. Um, but just to be able to say, all right, well we have this huge. 700 acre swap. We want to either fly it and map it, or we want to be able to go out and just find isolated areas that we know there's damage to certain types of trees or certain batches of trees. So we can better assess those for the future. So that became challenging. We uh, ended up doing a sighting study and essentially flying a drone as far as we could visually see that in this case, we're flying a Skydio X2D. Finding those areas, better documenting those areas, looking around and just really re reaching to what we could see visually. So the yeah, visual line of sight was definitely an issue with that, given a function of the technology. Say for other types of say fixed wing aircraft, or which were not available to us at the time, we could have gone and flown that area several years ago and be able to map it, take that, do GIS analysis on that, tech image segmentation, what have you, and say, you know, of this 700 acres, 50, 60 acres were affected by this. That was the meaningful portion of it back to what the client was looking for, for that. Another types of uh, activities, you know, one, just deconflicting the airspace with other manned aircraft that can have its own challenges. If you've ever flown around incredibly large aircraft, it is really tough to determine uh, where they are in proximity to how far you are deconflicted vertically, especially for that. Big object in the sky looks like it's real close yep. uh, and causes a couple of uh, you know, heart palpitations every now and then when trying to fly with that. But being able to better schedule that as well. A lot of what we do is safe for environmental purposes. It might be forestry related. It might be also construction monitoring related to that. So one, being able to go out, identify the area and just better break it into different chunks. One thing I always try to say from the get go, especially we have what larger swaths of land, you know, several hundred acres. Sometimes you can maintain visual line of sight, have the correct launch and recovery points for that, and really be able to stage the operation. We use field maps a lot for that. So we might have the aerial downloaded to the phone. We know our points of access, gate codes are into the, you know, even writing that as part of the data into the GIS, they are, right, this is gate code 4256, getting access to there. And then, you know, inevitably finding, well, that, that road's not usable um, in a rural area, looking at like a larger lease blocks of land outside of the containment areas prove that provided some interesting challenges. One, we were largely flying an EB at the time, say this a few years ago and finding enough air open area to be able to launch and recover the EB posed its own challenges there, but then being able to like, okay, well, how much can we really see until we lose visual line of sight? And I won't lie. There are a couple of times we're like, and we lost visual line of sight. Now we come back home. Okay. We know the extent here. Let's move to a new operational area. And even to the point where thankfully had a very understanding client with that of this section right here, we cannot get. So that evolved this into BB loss operations Yeah. Uh, for that. So we had a, a partnership with a, a company using a, a VTOL BB loss units for that on board, uh, you know, since an avoidance for that, we have a, both a not a geo restricted and a non geo restricted waiver currently for BB loss operations. And that really helped open things up. So i.e. that one area of, of tree stands where you can extend even that legally at an extra half a mile beyond the visual line of sight to be able to do that. Or daisy chain and, you know, essentially a, a hybrid of EV loss with a BB loss operation, say, we're going to do this linear corridor. 
and we know we can station people X number of miles apart, but we have an area of overlap where the BV loss takes over with those operations. That was huge. For mapping purposes, it also generated a tremendous amount of data and that right. posed its own challenges. So linear corridors, getting some of the drift within some of the models that we were creating from that, having to, you know, either institute, you know, ground control checkpoint, things of that nature were depending if it was a PPK operation or not, but it posed some really interesting learning challenges. And Matt, to, to lean in on that BV loss for, for a moment, because yeah. I think a lot of folks, like even for myself, have had those operational situations where it's like, dang it, I wish I had a BV loss waiver, but people, I think people have heard a lot of the horror stories of how difficult it can take, or it takes many, many months, but just how is that occurring? It's sure. getting those waivers, I guess is part A and part B is like, are these blanket waivers for a certain aircraft that you guys are able to say, Hey, the project could be from California back to North Carolina and you're able, or are they more like geographically restricted? So just how was the process overall to secure those waivers? And then how broad are those waivers to actually leverage that? Oh no, good point. So, so we started off with a geo restricted bus waiver, and this was for a 20,000, 30,000 acre site. I actually don't remember it quite. It was huge, a huge swath of land that we were looking and investigating for that. We started off there and that allowed us enough leeway to kind of expand one, the comfort level, and then also getting to know the operational limits of the aircraft, things of that nature. What's the optimal payload? I'm gonna tell you right now, if you're trying to wrap large amounts of forestry, your friend may be a lower resolution camera. I'll phrase it as such. Right. Um, right. Easier to make the data, easier to find those key tie points photogrammetrically as well. Um, and running into some of those types of challenges and just learning from that throughout the process. As it moves into a non-geo restricted way, right? E being able to fly in class geo sprays, that we did find that limited itself more to specific aircraft uh, as it was operationally or filed with the FAA for that. So that did run into where it might be that, well, FAA is a funny entity, right? Having one waiver, airspace authorization, what have you, really helps you get the next. I think it's something that most people don't understand. Even if you can file something small now, it will help you later on when you try to ask for something larger. It is about that relationship and showing a safety record of performance there with the FAA to get those different types of aspects of different operational or even airspace authorizations. So as we evolve towards a non geo restricted uh, B loss waiver, yes, I think one predicated the other to be able to get acceptance of that and then do become more uh, restricted to the air various aircraft. However, if let's say you have another analogous, and I'll stick with fixed wing technology because it lends itself to this better. If you have another type of fixed wing and you already have a non-geo restricted baby loss waiver with one type of fixed wing, getting it for the other aircraft, which for might have different positives, negatives for that particular operation, it helped one to get the other for that. And we've explored that option to with some other ones, like with the Wingtro, for instance, we've explored that option for them. And really it comes down to the type of work you want to engage in. Yes, it creates some freedom for the operations. There are still parameters and rules and guidelines to follow to that. It's not a carte blanche, just, oh yeah, just fly where you want to now. Right. That's another part of it. And there are some great manufacturers out there that really help in that BB loss as far as uh, putting together that petition with the FAA work with the FAA, understanding that legal side. Because no, I did not stop mid-career, go get a law degree or English and law degree, come back and go, I got this guys. Yeah, they, you really rely on your partners, your manufacturers, your different software vendors to be able to supply that information and help you with it, that process. Yeah, it's awesome. I know there was a cool project you guys have done. I think it was actually the first time I ever encountered you, I think it was at a conference, given you were giving this presentation, but Greenkey oh, Woods, yeah. without yeah. the benefit of a BV loss waiver, and you all are in the middle of a heavy, large wooded parcel, but y'all had a nice solution. I think came with a little bit of a hiccup for, for your poor set. Yeah. I'll let you tell that story yes. if you would, how y'all overcame that, that be loss limitation. I would like to preface that story with saying, I do not do heights well, and I am very happy to say that I was not involved in this operation, but I had some extended staff and some other folks in ACOM that were, they were braver than I. So I want to give them credit for that. So we had a, a large parcel is about four or 500 acres there for a siting study pre-construction for that. We intend to fly LIDAR on this wooded parcel area. However, as we just talked about, you can't only see everything from the road or there may not be another opening or break to be able to, to conduct, you know, illegal operations for that. So in this case, the person who was the main pilot was, had a built towards these kind of issues in the past and came up with a solution of renting a scissor lift. Having not worked in construction in that capacity, like I said, I worked on the survey side in the past, took that, brought that onto an access road, 
on even ground as best as possible and had a couple hiccups where at one point they discovered that man, that scissor lift really needs to be level and flat for it to function properly. Not in a tilting oops a daisy scenario, which I'm so glad did not occur, but even tethered into that basket that it sends there. I got stuck up there for about an hour. It was not his best day. The person who is a pilot we're closely with who did get stuck up there, let me know that he was okay. But after an hour of not being certain if he could get down or not, didn't kind of erode it on your bravery a little bit. You're like, am I, do I just live here? Do I have to sleep here tonight? Like those kind of things start to run through your head. Luckily they were able to get it better level down the ground and right send and then they were back be able to resume work again as normal but yeah not my, not my favorite to be at fights or earning even flying from a large parking deck is not my favorite thing in the world. yeah no i hear you that's a good reminder too folks who are renting a lift pay attention to all those operational concerns oh, yeah. and so on but it can be an effective tool if you're like hey i don't have a waiver but i need to get this large area done maybe subbing it out to someone with a manned aircraft isn't an op you know all those other options, maybe they don't exist, but a lift right. that might might be the solution. Yeah, and, and so many times too, like we've had an area where like we flew a, a thermal study on an arena prior to a recoding. And as we're citing it, I were like, man, how are we gonna see this? All right, all right, we're gonna get three more people. We're gonna have an extended visual line, you know, extended visual line of sight there, be able to just section it off in quarters of the building, something like that. And we get there and they had built a four story parking deck right beside it. No need had full visibility the entire time for that actually it was right at the same level there. So when we were planning our AGL flights, it was pretty much spot on to the roof of the building. And there's rare scenarios where it works itself out like that. Yes. Yeah. And then, but otherwise we had a game plan going into it to be able to see. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the last situation I want to take us would be nighttime operations. I think you've got a particular project, maybe it's ongoing or upcoming, but any words of wisdom or thoughts for this upcoming project, however you want to take it about just nighttime operations in general, and, and maybe some considerations folks might want to, might want to think about. Uh, so this is working with a state agency. We're doing a sighting study for a particular bird species. This is going to be in a Eastern Carolina rural area. So good for vegetation. You know, there's not trees in the area, luckily for that. And the idea is that we're looking for this bird species and to be able to fly during those night operations, flying about a hundred feet off the ground, being able to descend to about 50 feet, take the best resolution possible with a sensor for that. In this case, we're deploying Raptor T for this ANZU Raptor T, being able to take that snapshot, reascend back to a safe cruising altitude, and then continue on that mission for that. So challenges, one, we're very straightforward with the client from the entire time. You know, maintaining visual line of sight is a necessity. Even as we started looking into areas further and further away from operational areas, whether it be boat access, road access for that, you know, we will do the best we can up until we cannot see that. And one big thing we preach as far as like for training pilots with an AACOM, our pick always has the, the right to be able to say, no, this is not safe. And when it hits that for any one person, just like you throw a proverbial red card for that, go until you feel safe. If you do not feel safe, do not continue that operation. I don't care what happens. The, the consequences are, do not matter why, why you feel safe to fly for that. Yeah. Operational challenges too. I don't know about you, I sleep between the hours of 10 PM and 4 AM. So that posed an interesting challenge. So we talked about sleep schedule or sleep cycling off schedule, staying up a little bit later than prior two nights getting up to about staying about 3 a.m. or so, being able to meet those guidelines, getting into a vehicle after staying up that late. If you have one eye open and it's still dark outside, making sure that we understand there, bringing the option of camping out there, if that's a necessity, just having that tent sleeping bag ready or sleeping in the back of the car for that. All of those were on the table and discussed. Food, water, all the things, the necessities is part of that too. Just to be able to make sure that whatever we're doing, we can perform that job safe part of that yeah absolutely well Matt, man i've really enjoyed this discussion i thank you for coming on yeah. i know complex operations can go in a million directions and we just barely scratch yeah. the surface of, of a couple we'll keep maybe unpacking and i will do that or others will do that and i'd love to have you back on in the future we could tackle some other topics but anyway matt thank you again and to our listeners out there if you have a different question like us to tackle on this show please as always email me at chris at Submitted at ydqa.io or you're part of the Drone Launch Connect community. Ask me the questions there. Until next time, have a great week.